Good evening and welcome to St Paul's Cathedral. Good evening everybody. And welcome to this public debate on the Robin Hood tax. My name is Giles Fraser and I'm the Canon Chancellor of St Paul's Cathedral and Director of St Paul's Institute which is a think tank that we have here attached to the cathedral that seeks to bring the wisdom of the Christian tradition to bear on questions of money and finance. I arrived in this job in September 2009 in the immediate aftermath of a financial crisis that some said had brought global capitalism almost to its knees. Many financial institutions had gone bust and in a number of instances governments had to step in to support institutions with public money. It was at this stage that many people started asking questions about the social usefulness of the banking sector. How much does the City of London contribute to the common good? It's a question that has become considerably sharpened by various revelations about how little tax some banks actually pay. Putting a huge effort into tax avoidance is, of course, perfectly legal, but it does make the question of social usefulness all the more acute. The Robin Hood tax is a suggestion that financial institutions pay a 0.05% tax on their financial transactions and that the money raised goes to alleviate poverty. This is a proposal gaining more and more support amongst churches and politicians and some economists. The Archbishop of Canterbury came out in support of it last week. And this evening's event, run in conjunction with the Salvation Army, CAFOD and Tear Fund, seeks to explore how practical or desirable such a tax may be and whether it would indeed contribute to the common good. Helping us to examine these issues, it's very good to welcome Evan Davis, well known to many as a voice on the Today programme and a face on Dragon's Den. Evan is a distinguished economist, having worked for a while at the Institute for Fiscal Studies and since then and before today as the BBC's economics editor. That's right, Evan, isn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Evan Davis. Giles, thank you very much indeed, and it is a most enormous pleasure to be here. I've always wanted to sing in St. Paul's Cathedral, and uh, although this is my best chance for a while, I'll, uh, I'll pass in order not to spoil your evening. But let me give you a, a rhyme, three-line rhyme, uh, an old piece of folklore about tax. Don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the man behind the tree. Now, it gets to the heart of public debate on tax. We like to imagine that there are taxes that conjure up money from hidden corners of our economy that you don't feel and I don't feel, but which will do fantastic amounts of good. That we fantasize about taxes, uh, I think, indisputable. But our question for this evening fascinating and interesting question for this evening is as follows. Are the proposals for the Robin Hood tax just another example of finding a man behind a tree who we can tax in a way that doesn't hurt you and me and does large amounts of good? Is it just another imaginary pot of 20 billion pounds? Or do we have on the table in front of us a practical and sensible policy? Certainly, it's not often you get such large numbers of people to turn out to discuss, uh, warmly discuss, the idea of a tax increase. So something is going on, but does it make sense? Well, Giles has told you the proposal. There are really two parts of it. Part A, a tax of 0.05% on financial transactions in stocks, bonds, and foreign currencies, aiming to raise 20 billion pounds. Part B, we earmark that £20 billion to poverty reduction, international development, and mitigating the effects of climate change. It is a complicated subject for debate because you can believe in part A but not part B, and you can even believe in part B without believing in part A. So it's not quite as simple as yes or no. 
But what is clear is that the issue of taxing and banks has become very prevalent. We not only had a one-off bonus tax, one of the things that Alistair Darling did towards the tail end of the last government. We've got a new bank balance sheet tax, raising two and a half billion pounds a year. George Osborne, the Chancellor, has said his goal is to raise the maximum sustainable revenue from the banking sector. Uh, and the International Monetary Fund, a hard-headed bunch, have also been looking at all sorts of proposals for tax. We've got FTT, STT, FAT, as well as the balance sheet tax. We might hear more about all these proposals as we go. Now, today we were promised a debate uh, on the subject. I think it's actually less of a debate uh, than we might um, have had. We've lost one of our speakers, Ken Costa, who um, has lost a job today. He was chairman of International, uh, Lazard International. He isn't any longer. We await to hear and read about that story imminently, but we don't have him with us. Um, but what we're going to have is a panel discussion about the different aspects of the Robin Hood tax disposal, this, this, uh, disguise, uh, proposal. I'm going to give this very eminent panel five minutes each uh, to set out their stall. Then we take questions from the floor. Now, the way this works, ladies and gentlemen, is as follows. You don't ask questions and vocalize them as might often happen at public meetings. What you do is you write them down on the piece of paper that you've been given and you wave them in the air. And then the wandsmen, the glamorous assistants, will run around, collect them, uh, and they will be fed into a computer, and I will read them. Do put your name. Do put your name on them, ladies and gentlemen, so that we can uh, say who has asked the questions. Right, let me very briefly introduce the panel, um, and then I'll get our speakers to speak. Um, the Right Honourable... Shirley Williams, Baroness Williams, correct, Baroness? You can, skip it. you can skip all that. We'll call her Shirley. Hardly needs introducing, really. Co-founder of the Liberal Democrats, member of the House of Lords. Um, has been a very prominent domestic politician, but has taken a lot of interest in international affairs. Too has spoken on foreign affairs for her party in the Lords. Has a professor professorship emeritus at uh, the Kennedy School of Government at uh, Harvard, sits as a member of the International Commission on Nuclear Nonproliferation, and has been a co-president of Chatham House, the foreign affairs think tank, Shirley Williams. Um, Michael Green uh, is our late entrant, sitting next to Shirley, an independent economist and writer. He's written a couple of books with Matthew Bishop of The Economist, uh, The Road from Ruin, A New Capitalism for the Big Society, and Philanthrocapitalism, How Giving Can Save the World. He was formerly an official at DFID, uh, Department for International Development, but um, he joined there as an economist, had various senior roles there, and is now recovering. Um, going to the other end, uh, starting from the far end, Michael Itzer is an accountant by training, came up through um, Coopers and Librand in the 1980s. It's a measure of how much that profession has uh, changed, that the name Coopers and Librand, so familiar once, has uh, all but gone now. It's just a little bit of Coopers left in one of the names. Um, Michael is now the chief executive of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. With that post, he's been in strong demand in... Uh, sort of official duties and think tanks and things. Most relevant to us, he was the chair of a thing called the Leading Nations Group, examining the merits of the financial transactions tax, the international financial transactions tax. And sitting next to Michael um, is the Right Reverend Dr. Peter Selby, who was the Bishop of Worcester uh, for the 10 years to 2007. He was also the, uh, served as Bishop to Her Majesty's Prisons and was an elected church commissioner. He knows a thing or two about money as he was a member of the Assets Committee. Maybe he doesn't know a thing or two about money. Uh, that we will find out. Um, he's currently the president of the National Council for Independent Monitoring Boards. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our panel. Let's welcome them. And without further ado, let's hear from Shirley Williams. Shirley. Shirley. 
Well, first of all, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming um, to what is, I think, one of the great uh, achievements of the St. Paul's Institute, which is to look at the basic principles of Christianity and see how they should be applied in practice. And I'd like to say that I think it does some marvelous work, and I'm very, very pleased to be associated with it, because I think that's exactly what we need, to look at, at how one can actually translate those principles into the practical effects of everyday life. I'm going to talk for my five minutes about the broadest moral case for what is now called the Robin Hood tax, but which I always used to call the Tobin tax, because for many years I was on the same foundation as James Tobin, the Nobel Prize winner, Prize winning economist who was in fact the first man to invent the idea of the Tobin tax. In his case, the emphasis was primarily on slowing down what he perceived rightly to be a wild speculative market where it was very difficult to slow people down to take seriously the risks that they were undertaking, not with their own money, but with other people's money. And so he came up with the idea of the Tobin tax and he used to call it the sand in the oyster, the thing that turned an oyster into a pearl, but also managed to make the oyster work much harder to make the pearl than it would otherwise have done. I want to begin by saying that since the period which Evan Davis, and I'm delighted that he's our chairman, was talking about, that is to say the period just before the 2008 desperate crisis in the banking world, if we look back to that period over the last three years, one of the things that has happened is a steady increase in the gap between the rich and the poor, both in our own country, in the United States, and in the world as a whole. We live in an increasingly unequal society. I don't want to bore you with many statistics, but I'll just give you one, because it is such a remarkable statistic. In 1979, the 1% of, of the American population who had the highest incomes, 1%, had 10% of the gross national product of the United States to spend. 1% and 10%. That was 1979. By 2007, that figure had gone up from 10% to 21%. In other words, 1% of the population of the United States enjoyed more than a fifth of the whole gross national product of the United States. And the United Kingdom wasn't far behind. In 1979, 1%, the top 1% of our population had 6% of the gross national product. That was 1979. By the time we got to 2005, and it's gone on since then, I promise you, that 1% now enjoyed 14% of the gross national product. In other words, what we are looking at as the point from which we start is a massively growing inequality between the rich and the poor in our own country. That same story could be told globally. The countries which are poor, which the millennium goals will not reach or be reached by, are making very little progress many of them in Africa, some in Asia, still living in intense poverty. Even in a country like Libya, two-thirds of the population, despite the oil, has been living on less than $2 a day, and one can go on. So you're looking at huge inequalities in the world. What, if anything, could be done to narrow those inequalities and to do something effective about it? Well, just before we listen to the arguments of the market, let me just quote one word from the man who was the inspirer, the visionary, the very first market economist. You may know his name. It was Adam Smith. He wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations, which everybody's heard of. He wrote another book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, of which very few people, and particularly very few economists and bankers, have ever heard. Let me quote just a few words from Adam Smith. He said, Hence it is that to feel much for others and little for oneself, that is indeed 
the highest principle, to indulge our benevolent affections, consoling them towards the perfection of human nature. He went on to say it is wrong to injure others for one's own advantage. And he referred to the natural selfishness and rapacity of the rich, Adam Smith. And finally he said that he believed the most virtuous of all affections, therefore, was that embraced as its objective the happiness of all intelligent beings. And in the theory of moral sentiments, part seven, Adam Smith begins to foresee the Robin Hood tax by saying that the benefit should go to all intelligent beings throughout the world. An amazing foresight, one that is not taught in the business schools of our country. So let me turn then to what has been, I think, the great revelation of the banking crisis. And in case you think it's over, let me just remind you that only two weeks ago, we heard that the bonus and salary taken together of the three leading executives of Barclays Bank, one of our largest, and I'm only quoting one, came to 30 million pounds, 30 million pounds. But that was clearly not enough. In addition, the three of them split between them a further 77 million pounds, which was paid in respect of previous bonuses they should have had paid out, but because of the anger of the public were not paid out at the time, but all put away in a piggy bank to be paid out this year. The banks have gone back to their old ways, and I believe if they continue in their old ways, it's going to be very difficult indeed for them to retain the respect of the political system. So let me say a word in conclusion about the Tobin tax, the Robin Hood tax. It would, as the canon has told you, amount to 0.05%. It could be less. But that itself is only half of one-tenth of 1% one of the money that would be raised from transactions such as currency transactions and such as other financial transactions. Every time that you went out and bought some euros with your pounds, this tiny figure of one-tenth of one percent, half of one-tenth of one percent, would be deducted from it by a computer, making it almost impossible to avoid this tiny tax, this sand in the shell of the oyster. It would, however, raise from this country some 28 billion pounds, and if it was the EU as a whole, something more like 300 billion pounds. What would that pay for? It would pay for all our aid systems, and the EU is the biggest aid donor, so if the EU it was paid for, think what it would mean for other parts of the world. It would pay immediately for disasters, so that instead of sitting and watching things fall apart, we could move in at a very early stage. Two years ago, Mozambique was refused two million pounds to build flood defenses it asked for from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Two years later, the floods hit Mozambique, and no less than 60 million pounds were spent on dealing with the consequences of those floods. We look at the growing climate disasters in the world, the outcomes of such things as the disaster in Australia, in Japan, and in, going back for a bit, Haiti, and other parts of the world like Chile, think what it would mean. And I'll conclude with this. To have a fund that was internationally raised, that was not controlled by any particular nation state, that could be made available to the UN or another approved international body, and that would enable the whole world to take part in the suffering, but also deal with the suffering of the many, many millions of people who today face the consequences of climate change and do so without any cushion to protect them. Thank you for listening. Shirley, hold, hold your mic, your mic. Um, Shirley, just before we hear from Michael, uh, Michael Green, 
you said you would raise how much in this country? 20 or 28? 28. 28 billion. Who do you think will be bearing the burden of that tax? Who will be suffering as a result of that tax? You need to hold the mic. <laughs> I'll go back. Okay. I like it better. Okay. I hope you all heard the question, uh, Evan's question, a very good question. Who would be suffering as a consequence of the tax? The answer is virtually nobody. The great strength of this tax is there are literally thousands upon thousands of transactions every day. Indeed, more than thousands. There are trillions of transactions if you take a whole year. So a very tiny sum, and I mentioned the sum to you, from these millions of transactions, which hardly affect those that make the transaction, they wouldn't even notice it, does in fact raise very, very large sums of money. It's like bearing a heavy bucket of water between four people instead of one. The difference is such that you can bear the weight and you hardly notice the effects of it. We will, I'm sure, come back to that point as to whether there is, whether anyone would notice it. But we won't do that right now. Our next speaker is the one who came and came very late notice, really yesterday, in fact, was uh, dragooned into appearing. And we're very pleased to have him with us, Michael Green. Michael. Thank you, Evan, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Never dragooned. It was a pleasure. I was coming anyway, so I was honoured to be promoted to join this distinguished panel. Um, Evan began with a confession that he'd always wanted to sing here. Um, let me begin with a denial. Um, I'd like to say that I am not now and never have been a banker. Um, I think I should say that um, to proceed my remarks, because I am deeply disturbed by the Robin Hood tax. Um, I see three fundamental problems with it that I'd like to share with you tonight. The first one is, I think that the Robin Hood tax is not going to be just landing on no one in particular or landing in the ether somewhere. It's going to be landing on you and me and all the other customers of banks. I think that's pretty certain that a, bank, a tax that falls on the banks will be passed on to the customers. Indeed, I was even talking to a senior investment banker who was explaining to me how his own bank had prepared for the possibility of a Robin Hood tax and had worked out a way to pass the tax on to you and to make a profit out of it. I fear that if we think that the Robin Hood tax is going to be a tax on banks alone, we are sadly deluded. My second concern is that there's this argument that Shirley mentioned from James Tobin, that somehow if we put a tax on financial transactions, that is somehow going to reduce the tendency of our financial markets to crash, to reduce the vol volatility of our financial markets. Um, there was a study done at the end of last year by the Institute of Development Studies, and I commend it to you. It's quite a supportive study of the, of the Robin Hood tax, but one of its conclusions is very clear. The empirical evidence from various transaction taxes, like the Robin Hood tax, show that they actually increase market vol volatility rather than reducing it. So if our goal is to tax the bankers and also to make our financial markets less volatile, I fear that the Robin Hood tax misses both of those. Now, that isn't to say that there's, there may be arguments that it's a good thing to spend money on the poor. I'm just sceptical that a stealth tax is the way to do it, and I think if we want to spend money on the poor, on climate change, then we should do so in a transparent way through our regular taxation system rather than the Robin Hood stealth tax. My third concern is actually my greatest. My greatest concern about the Robin Hood tax is that it is a distraction, a distraction from the fundamental reform needed to global capitalism. It suffered a catastrophic failure in September 2008, and it is failing to contribute to a fair and just world. But I believe it has the potential to contribute a lot more if it's reformed. The problem with global capitalism at the moment is it is focused far too much on the short term. The manifestation of that short term greed is good mentality is of course the bonus culture. 
But I think the focus on that in our political debate is a focus on the symptoms rather than the causes. And if we're looking to the causes, I think we have to look beyond the morality play. Um, Shirley was mentioning the uh, Adam Smith theory of moral sentiments. Uh, I am an economist who's read it, uh, and I was very struck by his line that um, the candidates for fortune too readily abandon the paths of virtue. Um, and it is true. We in the financial sector, we had a culture that was known as, when doing deals, IBG, YBG. I'll be gone, you'll be gone. The deal is all that matters. Whether it's a good deal for our institution, for society, doesn't matter. That culture has to change. But as an economist, I have to say that will only change not through moral renewal, but through a change in the incentives. And in fact, one of the fundamental flaws we have in British capitalism, in global capitalism, is the incentives are all skewed towards the short term. The incentives that the banks face are actually driven by their shareholders. And those shareholders are very often large institutional investors. Institutional investors like pension funds, the pension funds who manage your money. When I was researching the book The Road from Ruin, I was absolutely astonished to discover that pension funds, rather than thinking about long-term investing, thinking about the future, are actually the most short-term investors in the market. They are the ones who are driving banks to ever increase their quarterly profits, to drive up their short-term share prices, and forget about the long-term consequences of their actions. Now, that's not to blame pension fund trustees personally, because that's actually a product of the way we regulate our pension funds. It's very boring technical stuff, so please forgive me. But the way pay pension funds are regulated is the trustees have what they call fiduciary responsibility. And to discharge their fiduciary responsibility, the role of trustees is to maximize the present value of the fund, rather than to think in any long-term way. And they're not allowed to think about trading off the long-term environmental consequences of an investment against short-term profit. This means that the driving force, the main investors in our economy, are actually pushing the whole of the economy towards this short-term bias. So I think one of the fundamental reforms that we need is to change those rules on fiduciary responsibility. And I commend to you a report that's being brought out tomorrow by a fantastic organisation called Fair Pensions that's talking about how this needs to happen. And it's a campaign that we should all join. Because this is actually something we should be campaigning about. This is our money. Uh, this is our money that's invested in pension funds, invested in life insurance policies, that we've given over to financial institutions to invest, but they're investing in this incredibly short-term way. And it's in this sense that we have to take responsibility. If we want a capitalism that is interested in a fairer world, a more sustainable world, a more socially just world, then we have to take a, a share of responsibility in controlling how that money is used. It's astonishing, over the last 25 years, we've become incredibly smart consumers in whether it's choosing fair trade or sustainable fish or whatever. Big multinational companies respond to what consumers say. On the other hand, in the way that we invest our money, in the way that we save, we're still incredibly passive. And that's got to change. Because we can't just expect that we'll hand our money over to other people and they will be good stewards. If we believe our planet, our society needs good stewarding, that has to be our responsibility and we have to be a part in making a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Just out of interest, uh, how many of you in the audience tonight um, work in the city uh, in one form or another, work in financial services? So we, not the majority of you, I think it's fair to say. Just a few of you, just a few. Well, great to have you here. And do remember you can ask questions by writing them down and waving your hands in the air. Michael, interesting proposition. Is your case that if we did reform along the lines that you wanted to, the profits and the bonuses in the financial sector would be smaller, because that was clearly quite a lot of what was in Shirley's mind when she supported the tax. Well, I think well, they, they may be smaller, but I think they'd be aligned much more to the things that we really, really value. Um, I'm not, I think they probably would be. So there wouldn't be as much to tax, is my point. I mean, if we did what you want, there wouldn't be a big 
goose waiting to be, uh, I don't know, I'm going to mix metaphors, waiting <laughs> to be milked or whatever. I, I mean, it would be, um, it wouldn't work. I mean, well, it, it may be small, but since it would be the people whose money is actually being invested, right. we'll be making the decision on how those bonus, right. how big those bonuses are. So it is and an alternative rather than a complement to the idea of a Robin Hood tax, basically. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, okay, very clear. Um, okay, our third speaker, Michael Itzer, Chief Executive of the uh, Chartered Institute of Accountants in England and Wales. Michael. Well, good evening, everybody. As Evan said in his introduction, uh, the reason why I'm here tonight is because I ended up uh, chairing a committee that was looking at innovative ways of funding development. Well, the story starts in October 2009. I received a call from the UK Treasury asking me if I would be part of an international panel who would be looking at innovative ways of funding Millennium Development Goals and climate change. Uh, after about five minutes of protestation from me that I really wasn't the right person to be looking at innovative ways of financing these uh, very laudable uh, causes, um, I was persuaded that what they actually needed was someone who wasn't a banker, and who was going to look at the situation objectively and come up with an independent opinion. Perfect for a chartered accountant. So that's what, uh, that's what started the process. The, uh, the committee had members from 10 different countries on it. Everybody on the committee, apart from me, was a development ec uh, economist, and everyone was a professor apart from me, um, and I ended up chairing the committee. Our terms of reference were to look at a source of raising funds which would be relatively simple to do, which would be sustainable over a period of time, and could generate a substantial amount of money. In the course of our six or seven months when we were looking at the problem, we considered financial transaction taxes, we considered asset taxes, we considered bank levies, and all of these things we put, we put to one side. The only thing that was uh, considered uh, a viable alternative to our primary recommendation was actually imposing VAT on financial transactions, but that was something that we didn't pursue and recommend because it appeared to have a complexity which we couldn't be certain could be delivered. What we did decide to recommend, and this is the report that we produced last summer, was that we should introduce a currency transaction levy. Now, you've already heard Shirley reference this as a Tobin tax. When James Tobin actually devised uh, the concept in the 1970s, it couldn't actually be delivered at that point in time. The technology didn't exist. And whenever the idea has been resurrected subsequently, that's been one of the principal arguments that people have raised against it. You can't do it, it's too complicated. So one of the fundamental things that we were looking at was could you actually do it today? Had technology moved on sufficiently to allow this to take place? And our conclusion, very definitely, and indeed the conclusion of all the financiers and central bankers that we spoke to, was that it has. Uh, if you'll excuse the technicalities, there are two ways of collecting this. You can collect it through a real-time gross settlement system, which is run by every central bank in the world, or you can run it through the continuous linked settlement bank, which didn't exist 15 years ago, but it exists today, and about 80% of all foreign exchange transactions in the world take place and are settled through that system. So we, we developed our report, we made our recommendation, and just to give you some slightly different numbers to the numbers that you heard earlier, we estimated that if you were to introduce a currency transaction levy of half of one basis point, so remember that a basis point, there are 100 basis points in 1%. So a half of one basis point 
introduced at the point of settlement for the dollar, sterling, yen, and euro, which are the four main currencies trans, uh, traded around the world, would raise between 25 and $30 billion annually. Now, some people say that's not enough. You know, that's not enough to do all the things that we want to do. But to me, that's an enormous amount of money, and I'm sure that if you were to talk to development agencies and indeed many governments around the world about having that as an extra resource, uh, they'd probably uh, bite your hand off at the moment. There are, however, uh, a number of things just to, just to mention. In terms of uh, who bears the tax, I mean, we're not naive about this. I mean, it is very likely that the tax would be borne by the people who are engaging in the foreign exchange trading. So it would be passed on to customers. This would not be borne by the banks. But just to give you an idea of what it actually means in pound notes, if you were to introduce a tax at that level, half of one basis point, on a financial currency transaction of 100,000 pounds, the levy would be five pounds. Just put that into perspective. It's not a great deal of money. The other thing that we're very conscious of is that if you've actually got 25 to 30 billion dollars or pounds in the system, aren't some financiers going to put a wet towel around their head and try and figure out a way of actually preventing that being paid over or helping their clients get round it? Well, that's always a possibility. But um, I think if you were going to introduce a levy at a time when the financial sector realises that it hasn't done the global economy any favours, now is the time. So our report was delivered uh, last June, and it was presented to the United Nations in September. And in terms of where it goes from here, it's actually now being taken forward by the French government. The, the French uh, are very much embracing this as an idea. Uh, President Sarkozy has spoken about it, and he plans to put it on the G20 agenda later this year. The slight hiccup from our perspective is that the UK are dead against it. And until you get uh, the UK politicians in favour of it, frankly, it isn't going to happen. So if any of you would like to read it, uh, you can find it on the website of the leadinggroup.org. Now, what I'd like to do, if I can, in my final couple of minutes, is I'd like to just go off-piste slightly and tell you about an idea that I've got, which wasn't the idea of the committee, but in so many of these situations, when you actually get involved in a project, you sort of continue to maintain a passing interest in it, and you start to think about the ideas and whether or not you can work it up in a slightly different way. This is my suggestion. Whenever you have a meeting at the moment that has regulators, central bankers, and indeed politicians who are responsible for finance departments, everyone is concerned about the next crisis. What is going to cause the next bubble? And we can all have our ideas about this. It could be commodities, it could be property. One of the things that concerns me is foreign exchange. So back to the subject of this report. In the last quarter of 2010, foreign exchange daily trading volumes around the world hit $4.3 trillion a day. Let me just say that again. $4.3 trillion a day. Now, if you compare that with the London Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange daily trading volumes are £5 billion. Pounds. I mean, it is a market that is so much bigger than that in equities. But what, uh, what concerns me more is it's starting to show a lot of characteristics that are bubble-like. 
There are many, many speculators in the market. And for those of you who follow football, you may have noticed that this season, uh, both Aston Villa and Fulham are wearing on their shirts FX Pro with the little slogan underneath, trade for an exchange like a professional. People are being encouraged to take a bet on the financial exchange markets when frankly they don't have the experience. Now, I think that they, this has all the potential to create a bubble market. So why should this now change the arguments and why should this be different? Well, every politician, every regulator fears a collapse. What they're doing, though, in some of the sectors of the market that did overheat in the crisis we've just been through, is that they're insisting that certain products, derivative swaps, are now, start, now have to be traded over central exchanges so that regulators have got visibility of what's going on. That isn't the case for foreign exchange. So I actually think there's a very strong case to be made for actually insisting that foreign exchange is traded over a mandatory central platform around the world. And the price of participating in this foreign exchange trading and taking part in the platform is half of one basis point. A very small sum of money to give regulators and everyone confidence that this is not a market that is going to explode. And if I was a politician thinking about my legacy and my inheritance, I think that if you were to leave the world a steady stream of income of between 25 and 30 billion dollars a year that could be used for social good, I think that would be quite a legacy. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. And I, I should say we've had a question, and this is one I wanted to ask you anyway, a question from the floor, that the, your figure was how much your, your, commission, your committee's proposal it raised 20... 25, between 25 and $30 billion annually. Dollars. So less than £20 billion. Pounds, yep. And that's internationally, not just in the UK. That, that's just on those four right. currencies. But that's the global revenue, not yep. the UK Absolutely. revenue. Absolutely. Yep. Because Shirley's tax is about 10 times higher. Her rate is 10 times higher than yours. Mine wasn't just limited microphone. to No, no. And my, you need to put the microphone on. Um, it, so, so yours is ten a tenth of the rate and is raising a tenth as much because it's yep. uh, according to... So, so I think there is a correlation between yeah, the two. Yeah, I, I think there is. Yep. But Shirley, as you say, the, the, the currency side is probably the biggest of the... Um, of the sides on this. Okay, well, let's get our last speaker to set out his stall, Peter. There's an uncomfortable footnote uh, to Shirley Williams's uh, very strong statements about the increased gap between rich and poor. And that uncomfortable footnote happens to be one that concerns me greatly, which is that the people with the most money, the societies with the most money, spend more of their money locking people up than those societies that have least. So that at the bottom of the gap between rich and poor are people who are losing their freedom, being led into unconstructive lives, and being lost to the constructive ways of human living. All that makes it very awkward to come to a gathering of this kind and use that privileged position, and it's a huge privilege, to undermine what could actually be the producer of money for poor people. If you're sitting in this cathedral at the moment and you're not a poor person, you will find, as I do, it very difficult to oppose a proposal that stands any kind of chance of producing money for poor people. 
And it may well be that we have found a tax to apply to the man that Evan mentioned behind the tree. A tax that would cause minimal discomfort to many of us and would nevertheless benefit large numbers of the most needy. It would be nice to think that such a discovery had been made and it's only one's niggling sense of suspicion that that which is not hurting probably isn't working that makes one wonder if that is really such a good idea. And why I'm really wanting to raise a question or two about this proposal is because I think that taxing is a very ambiguous activity. On the one hand, it extracts money from the people who have most of it to give to those who have least, or at least it causes those who have most of it to give more to the well-being of society than those who have less. That seems a good thing to do. The trouble is that it also has the effect of making activities look sort of okay that really aren't. Criminality in our society, and I come back to that, is heavily related to issues like alcohol and gambling. But alcohol and gambling are taxed activities. Let me be clear, I'm in favor of Robin Hood taxation. That is, I'm in favor of progressive taxes. I'm in favor of people who have the most contributing the most. But what I'm not in favor of is using taxation as a way of making something that isn't right all right. And the financial sector has shown quite clearly that it is not all right. And it won't be made all right by giving it, making it contribute half a basis point to the well-being of the world. What's at stake here is the years for eight decades really since we went onto a system of banking, the fractional reserve banking system, which causes banks to be the major creators of money in our society. And a privilege that used to belong to government, to the sovereign, that's why pound coins were called sovereigns, a, a privilege that belonged to the sovereign has now been usurped by people who use not their money, but who print it all the time, and who become in the process too big to fail. And because they're too big to fail, we, you and I, are led to produce large sums of money to keep them going, only to find that they don't change their ways at all. I belong to a small organization called the Christian Council for monetary justice. It seeks to bring under God's control what seems to have passed out of God's control. And as the Bible warned, the service of mammon cannot be conjoined with the service of God. My worry about the Tobin tax or the Robin Hood tax as currently proposed is that it stands every chance, yes, of raising good sums of money, but at the same time of making a system that is fundamentally corrupt and that will fundamentally lead to disaster after disaster look all right. And I don't want to be involved in making something that is clearly wrong look as though it's right. Thank you very much, uh, very much indeed, Peter. You'll notice that Peter and Michael here, the two sitting closest to me, have taken a very similar line, that they would rather reform the financial system than tax it. And from the two extremes of the table, 
Shirley and the other Michael are making proposals that effectively say there are things you can do to raise some money. Shirley's is the most ambitious, uh, Michael's is perhaps a little more limited, uh, but is an international, an international proposal. Um, I do want to just pick you up though, Peter, on this issue, because we understand exactly what you've been saying, and alcohol tax is a very good analogy for, for the argument you're giving over banking tax. I mean, in a world where alcohol is going to be legal, and people are going to imbibe, you're not saying that you don't think we should tax alcohol. You're not saying it should be marketed at cost. I mean, there would be, you know, 15p a, a pint of beer, wouldn't it? Uh, well, I think something has to be done about alcohol that is more significant than, what, than what's being done by this actually quite small amount of taxation right. which it raises. Right, but so in, in a second best world where you can't cure the problem, isn't taxing it a second best option? It's a second best option provided you don't use it to prevent yourself from noticing what's actually right. at stake. Okay. So it might be a pragmatic solution if you've explored all the possible options for dealing with the underlying issue. But if you've done that and you can't, you might think taxation was a, a backdoor route to paying well, back some of the damage. It's simply the point that I, I made yeah. right at the beginning, which is that you can't come here if you're a person who's not poor and proclaim yourself from a high moral position opposed to something which might actually right. help people. Right. Right. Okay. Well, as I say, it's very clear where everybody, uh, everybody's coming from, and we do have effectively, a, uh, if you like, two or so different views, nuances there are, two or so different views. We're getting some questions in. I should tell you, you can tweet your questions in as well if you have mobile devices to hand. Um, and a not bad uh, way of signaling that you're tweeting them is to put a hash RHT debate, RHT debate, and then they'll, um, they'll get the questions, uh, they'll see them over there and feed them in. We do have a question though, which I think is extremely relevant, and I just want to run it past all of you, which is the question about international versus domestic. I just want you each to say, um, uh, Shirley and Michael Itzer, whether it is a tax that Britain could pursue unilaterally or whether it is a tax that can only be pursued internationally. And then I'll get comments from Peter and the other Michael too. But um, this is a question actually that's been put by Gavin Shuka, MP, who's uh, in the House. But Shirley, why don't you start? Well, let me, um, is that going to work? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me begin by saying that I, very, I found what Michael said, the far Michael, uh, on the subject of a single global platform through which foreign exchange would take place, an extremely fascinating idea, because it would make the, it would make the uh, Robin Hood tax work on an international level. Now, the problem is that there are some countries, I'm afraid, for example, the United States, which so far have been very resistant indeed to the idea of adopting uh, a Robin Hood tax. And I think that what that means in real practice, in everyday political practice, is that we might be able to encourage a proportion of the world's nations, probably led by the European Union and by France, to adopt a limited form of Robin Hood tax. That would still bring in a lot of money, but it would obviously not bring in anything like as much money as a true global system. Being practical, therefore, my feeling is quite straightforward. We should do all we can to press as large a section of the rich countries of the world to adopt it. And I think once it's shown clearly that that brings in money that can be used for purposes that we've talked about, natural disasters and international poverty, I think that it will commend itself increasingly to countries that haven't subscribed at the beginning. So, so we, we start, start a coalition of the willing Correct. But without waiting for everybody to be on board. Um, what about you, Michael? Was your committee in favour of individual countries doing it regardless of whether everybody did it? We're very clear that this would have to be um, an international proposition. And the, the reason for that is that uh, if it wasn't, you would find uh, lots of 
trading migrating to other jurisdictions. Now, there, there, there are a couple of contradictory pieces of uh, evidence here. In the mid-1990s, Sweden introduced a foreign exchange tax on all of its currency transactions. And within a matter of days, the whole industry had shut down and moved to London. Within a matter of days. Brazil introduced a currency transaction levy in 2008 to raise money to alleviate poverty in Brazil. And so far, that's had relatively little impact on Brazilian trading. So I don't know whether it was something to do with proximity of market, uh, but, but, that, but that seemed to work better. Now, can Stamp I... duty works better, of course. We have that in the UK. Uh, absolutely. But, but just on Shirley's point about the US, that the US are very difficult to engage on this subject, but we actually went and did panels in both New York and Washington. And I have to say, it was a bit like going into the lion's den, but as soon as they found out that what we were actually talking about was half of one basis point, they didn't care. Yeah. I mean, it was just such a small amount of money. Oh, that's okay then. Uh, and it was like, what's the big deal about? So, I mean, I think it just has to be couched in those terms. Right. I don't know whether the other of you have... Peter, do you have a, a comment on Britain going it alone or other countries going it alone versus a kind of trying to get the entire world together, which obviously probably means you never do anything? Well, I'd only like to say one thing about that, and that is that it's one of the most tedious uh, refrains <laughs> of the finance sector to say that you mustn't tax us, you mustn't hurt us, you mustn't punish us, you mustn't control us, because we'll all go and migrate somewhere else if you do. Um, and I, I think that that's an argument for international a action, of course, but it's also a very, very revealing uh, statement by people that actually in the end, apparently, it matters more to make money than to live in your home among your friends and family. That's a very interesting statement and is part of, I think, a, d a disease that the financial sector has contracted. And, 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 and a quick comment from you, Michael. Just a quick comment. I mean, when we start talking about trillions and billions, the numbers start to wash over us. And I just want to do a little reality check. I mean, the number that Shirley talked about, $300 billion, would be a game-changing number for the fight against global poverty. 20 or 30 billion actually isn't so big. I mean, total aid volumes are between 100 and 150 billion dollars a year. And I think the other question I would have is, what would be the second round effect of such a tax and such a fund? I would bet my bottom billion dollars that uh, you would then see other rich countries pulling back from other aid commitments, and actually the money wouldn't be additional. That's quite Sadly. possible. It would just be a new tax to pay for the aid that we're already uh, yeah. engaging in. Um, just on numbers, I just want to give you a number that £20 billion is equivalent to £20 a week for every household in the country, more or less. I mean, that is what we're talking about when, we, when we're throwing, just, just to give a sort of scale check on what we're talking about. Yeah, here's the thing. It's a billion pounds is £20 a week for a million households. That's... that's how to think about what billions are. Right, let's take another question here. Shirley, this is one I think for you. William Sweet has asked, is the Robin Hood tax revenge for the financial crisis? Now, I think this is a very interesting question. Is it deep down that what motivates you, the desire to punish the city, or is it the worthier goal of the benefits that would come out of the Robin Hood tax? Oh, of course, it's both. It's both. I mean, uh, the benefits are very real. Um, we know that we can make these benefits, and they're ones that would really help people in desperate plights all over the world. But there is an element of punishment, yes, because I think the fact that the financial uh, sector turned its back on paying its fair share of the cost of bailing it out doesn't make it a kind of vicious act of punishment, it's an act of justice. The financial sector has not yet paid back a substantial part of the money that the rest of us paid to save it, and the rest of us have earnings, all of us, 
substantially less than those in the financial sector, so it wasn't even fair. And what do you say to Peter's point that it would be better to reform the financial sector to deal with the problems that were so evident two years ago, rather than to say, we've come up with a wheeze that would allow us to benefit from the fact of punishing you for the problems that you created two years ago by spending your money? There is no conflict. Both need to be done. We're talking about the Tobin tax or Robin Hood tax largely for the benefit it can bring to the rest of the world and to dealing with issues like immense natural disasters, of which we've seen a huge number just this year alone. But the sl slower, longer uh, pro process, which I think, among others, the two Michaels referred to, the short-termism of the financial sector, has to be dealt with, as my Michael, close to me, said, by changing such things as the fiduciary duties. And I would take another one. I mean, one of the things that I'm very acutely aware of is that the bottom line moved from being an annual statement for many banks to being a quarterly statement. In some, it's even moving towards being a monthly statement. And that means that people to keep their jobs have to show a constant increase in their profitability, even though that may be directly contrary to the interests of the country and the world, which is for long-term solid investment, bringing in modest interest rates, but enabling the world to grow in a sensible manner. There is no conflict. Michael, is there a conflict or not? This is, I think, a really important point, because I think most of the people who support the Robin Hood tax, like Shirley, would also support reform. So it's critical to know yeah. that if you get that reform, is there going to be the fat in the system that allows you to extract 20, 30 billion pounds a year out of it? Uh, I, th I think this desire to claw back the cost is a really dangerous distraction. I think if we look at trying to exact revenge or retribution, um, the danger is that leads us in the wrong direction. I, this is why I'm saying I think the debate needs to move on and start talking about what is a financial sector that serves society and how do we build that. And that is far and away the most important question than extracting bank levies or bonus taxes. You know, I think I feel those are a real distraction to the debate and they're actually stopping us moving forward. But can I ask Michael? Um, Microphone. I just want to come back on you, Michael. You didn't comment on whether there was any real conflict between the two. <coughs> Uh, could you kindly tell us why you think there is a conflict between the two, reforming the system and bringing in the Tobin tax? I think the conflict is that I see a real danger that if we do a measure like the, to like the Tobin tax, like the Robin Hood tax, we'll think the job is done. Um, we'll have extracted our blood from the, the bankers and we can see the job as being finished. And that to me still feels like a real distraction especially when you add to the potential damage and the lack of benefit that the tax, I think, will deliver. Uh, Michael Itzer. Uh, Evan, to come back to your original question, I mean, I'm, I'm not motivated uh, in this in any way of wanting to stick it to the financial sector. I mean, that's just not my motivation. But what we recognised in our report is that over the past couple of decades, many people in the world have enjoyed a higher standard of living and increased prosperity. And they've done that largely through global trade. And the people who would bear the burden of this levy would be people who are trading globally, because it wouldn't be borne by the banks, it would be borne by the businesses. So this is actually an equitable way of distributing it through, through the global system. But if what, you're actually, if what you actually want to do is hit the investment banks, this doesn't do it. Shirley, I mean, that's, we now have, a, if you like, a very important proposition. Do you think your proposals would hit the investment banks? Microphone. No, Microphone. Um, <laughs> what would hit the investment banks? Um, I mean, it, it, the, the proposal on the Tobin tax, on the Robin Hood tax, is frankly too small to seriously affect any of the banks, in my view. It's a relatively tiny outcome. No, 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 no surely. It, it's, it's £20 billion. Pounds. That's what, twice the total bonus pool of the, London, the City of London? I mean, oh, it's a big it's, deal. It's, no, I mean, it is, it is a significant amount of of money. You can't magic it up from nothing. So it is 
It but is it, isn't, it isn't going to be taken directly from the banks. No. Uh, it'll be partly bought but by who, customers. Who will, well, who will bear it then? You see, if it's £20 billion, pounds, who is going to pay it? Who is going to pay it? Who do you think is going to be worse off? I think some of it will be passed on. For example, I think the really large traders in foreign exchange, for whom this is a substantial part of their profit, will pass some of it on. But I think it will still be a relatively tiny proportion of their total outgoings. I still want to say, because you started on a different tack, Evan, that I, mean, I think this argument about punishment is absurd. I don't want to punish the banks. I think the banks should pay back a larger part of what they borrowed from the rest of us, and I think that's justice and not punishment. What I think does need to be said, though, and I remember very well, because I just finished writing about credit and debt, and coming to my last job at the point at which the Jubilee 2000 campaign was taking off. And I just had that sense of being surrounded by people who, at a, who had suddenly got an economic lesson that they could understand inside themselves. And what I think we have got to take seriously is not whether the five people sitting at this table or even the hundreds of people sitting in this cathedral are punitive in their instincts. But we do have to take seriously the fact that this proposal can easily take on a life of its own because people see it as a way of getting money out of people who aren't like them. And I think that would be very unhelpful to our dealing with a problem which actually all of us are involved in. Right. I mean, I should say, we've, we've got uh, from the floor someone's put up the information that uh, a YouGov poll for Oxfam suggests that a majority of people in Britain, Germany, France, Spain and Italy do all support the tax and 90% or so believe that banks should pay for the damage caused by the financial crisis. I don't think many people would be terribly surprised to hear that the public think the banks should pay for the damage caused by the financial crisis. Let's move on to a... Um, a different question. We've got Eliza here, and it gives, I suppose, a, a practical question, which I want to put to you, Michael, which is, who decides on how to use the money raised from the Robin Hood tax? We've talked about the, the tax. We haven't talked about how you spend it very much, have we? Uh, did, who decides under your proposal? Well, we, um, w we felt that if you were actually going to get national governments engaged and participating in it, uh, a proportion of it had to stay with the national governments to spend for their own development um, purposes. The rest could be used on international projects. Now, from, uh, from our experience, uh, and remember most of the people on the committee were actually uh, economists who worked in the development area, they, they were all acutely aware of the fact that whenever you have created international organisations to spend money internationally, it's fraught with problems. It's fraught with people uh, and misappropriating it, uh, embezzlement, it, it is really difficult. Uh, and I've, um, in the course of my um, career, had to deal with the World Bank on a number of occasions. And within within quarter of an hour, the discussions with the World Bank always get into how much money is being siphoned off by somebody somewhere taking their turn. So, so we, we felt that there probably wasn't um, an organization today that, that we should just channel this money into. And it would probably have to be one that was conceived specifically for the purpose. Right, so we divvy it up to the government. Yeah. But that might create your problem, um, Michael, that the government say thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. They just pass off other responsibilities. And isn't this really worrying that this, we don't know actually how we're going to spend this money? And to then say, oh, we're just going to create something and it won't be as bad as what we have before, does to me, frankly, seem like a cop-out. And I think we do have to put a little bit into this argument about the fact that the challenge around poverty and global development particularly is not just about resources. It's about effectiveness of the whole global development institutional structures. And we can't leave that out of the discussion. It's not just about the money. Shirley, you, yeah, you gave us very uh, little bit on the who would, who would spend it, but give us a little more on your, your view of it. Well, I don't really completely buy this because I think, the, uh, I think it sounds like one of the usual reasons for why one shouldn't give any money. It's when you give something, for example, to a homeless person and somebody says, they'll spend it all on drugs. And that means that you get let off having to feel embarrassing as you pass the homeless person and give him or her enough money to buy themselves some kind of meal. Well, that won't do. That undermines all charitable instincts and it's 
just, uh, it's just an excuse in my view. You then look at how you could administer it effectively. Let me give you an example. Uh, you could have helped to finance, we could help to finance, the amazing radical departure that has happened in Brazil in the last four years with children in Brazil for the first time ever being given a meal, at, a full meal at school every single day, which has by itself, incidentally, reduced the level of poverty in Brazil, and child poverty in Brazil dramatically. It's also, for the first time in the history, modern history of Brazil, narrowed the gap between rich and poor. Now, that's a successful scheme. Brazil runs it effectively. I'm sure there's some corruption around the edges, but generally speaking, it's been approved by uh, bodies like the UNDP and others as an outstanding scheme. So what you do is you look at the schemes that are out there, you help the ones that clearly are working pretty well, and you then try to seed that same scheme in other countries where no but such thing is happening. I don't think it's all that difficult. Eliza's question on, on Twitter was, though, who would decide? Now, that sounds like... You, you've shown that there are good things you can do. Right. Who would be deciding? Who's in charge? The well, UN. I, I personally would believe that there should be some form of uh, international body set up for the purpose. Right. A, sp which, a new one. That, a new one. Yeah. But don't forget the UNDP, the United Nations Development Programme, has a far better record on issues concerning corruption, etc., than the World Bank. I sympathize with what Michael says about the World Bank. It has had bad phases. It depends a bit on who's the chairman and things like that. But the UNDP, which is much more short of money, has much less money to use, has as good a track record as the World Bank has a slightly dodgy okay. track record. So again, I would say, take the example of the UNDP and build on something like that. OK, I've got a quick one, which I'm going to give to you, Peter. This is from the floor. Would it be a good idea to look at Islamic banking? Um, my own um, conviction is that um, money lies at the deep root of much inter-religious conflict. And um, that is perfectly obvious if you consider the terrible history of the relationship that uh, Christians have had towards the Jewish people. But it's now, I think, a really serious issue in relation to uh, Islamic people. And I, I actually believe that the ferocity with which the Quran um, denounces uh, the practice of lending at interest um, reflects the failure of the church of the time and since to grapple seriously with what it means to believe in God and not to believe in money. And so um, my answer is uh, Islamic financiers and theologians have a considerable struggle in living out their convictions in the contemporary world, and so do we, and it would be a jolly good idea to be trying to do it together. Right, good answer, and we're not going to follow up on that with the other guests, because we're not going to get into a debate about Islamic banking tonight. Too much to talk about. Right, another question from the floor. No one, they haven't given their name. President Sarkozy has asked Bill Gates to explore ways of raising money for development and climate change. The financial transaction tax, Tobin tax, uh, is, is one idea. What other ideas could Bill Gates look at? Okay, I'm going to put this to my two less enamored with the Robin Hood tax because having not poo-pooed, but having not supported the idea of the Robin Hood tax, Give us, your, give us your bright idea for raising money for the poor. Um, we interviewed uh, Bill Gates for one of our books and uh, asked him, one of the questions we asked him was, you know, you know, how do you see your role? What's the role of this enormous foundation that's giving away three or four billion dollars a year? And he said, we're actually just a tiny, tiny organization. Because if you take the scale of our resources compared to the scale of the problems we're trying to tackle, it's very, very little money. And I think one of the really interesting things that Bill Gates has been starting to think about is how he uses the endowment that pays for his foundation in creative ways to channel more investment into, de into developing countries. And I think this is a really, really exciting development, that rather than this traditional model of we earn money 
that we then have to pay taxes to compensate for, that actually we can start to use the financial markets, even the profit motive, to do good, to tackle poverty, to tackle climate change, is I think one of the most really exciting developments we're seeing in the world at the moment. And I think it's a shame if we don't appreciate its value because we're too busy bashing the bankers. What about you, Peter? Uh, I think that... Um I think that Bill Gates has to ask some questions about how you engage the public in solidarity with the poor. Because until those questions are answered, we shall always be dealing in, in giving um, at the edges of our income and of our prosperity. So I really want him to devote quite a lot of energy to the communication skills, which he certainly has, because what is required is nothing less th than conversion. And until that happens, I think we'll always be content with uh, half of a basis point. And half of a basis point is not what we are asked by our maker to consider. Right, OK. Um, I'm going to take another couple of, if you like, specific questions from the floor. I've got another couple of... Uh of uh, uh, big questions, really, which I, I want to ask as well. But this very specific one, banks always complain about taxes but never actually leave London. Will Hutton, the economist, has said this fear that they will leave London is balderdash. Does the panel agree that the two and a half billion levy that we have in the UK now, the bank balance sheet tax, isn't big enough? Who, uh, so we'll just quickly run down the panel. Who thinks we could try and get more out of the banks than we're currently doing with this two and a half billion pound level levy? Michael Litzer. I am, um, well, I, I'm probably going to be in a minority of one here, but I, I do think that um, every, every board of every major PLC uh, now has it as a, as a standing exercise every year to perform a calculation to see whether or not the company would be better off if it was based in a different tax jurisdiction. And there are, there are people that I know who have moved their tax base to either the Channel Islands, the Caribbean, uh, Switzerland, Luxembourg, and, and they will do it, uh, and they have done it. Now, w whether, whether it actually means then that you uproot all your people... You probably don't. I mean, you, you, you probably don't, and, and trading activities carry on. But, but I think over time it is going to undermine London and the UK as, as, a, as a financial and a corporate centre. Before I get the others to comment on the two and a half billion, the follow-up to you, Michael, is from Richard Murphy, who on Twitter said, should we tolerate the tax havens that help banks avoid our taxes on them? I mean, it, the, clearly the problem is they move out of the UK, they go to Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Monaco. I mean, it's... it's we could just close the Channel Islands down if we wanted well, if, to, if, couldn't we? Yeah, but if a, if, a biz, if a business takes a conscious decision to move, it, that, 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 is, that is a business decision that's been taken. It isn't, it isn't by way of avoiding tax by subterfuge, is it? It's not subterfuge, no. No, it's not, it's not money laundering. Um, Peter? I'm, I raised a question in my initial remarks about taxing particular activities. Um, and I think I have great doubts about that. I think people should pay more tax if they've got more money. And I think we've got to find ways of making sure that people who have the most money pay the most tax, which at the moment, on the whole, they don't. But that's what we've got to do, not because they engage in banking, not because they engage in alcohol production, not because they engage in some activity which we thought, ah, that might be one we could, we could get some money out of. People should pay in proportion to their means. That, that's a, 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 a mandate that goes back rather a long way into the, into the history of humankind, and I think it's a better method than any other. And if people don't want to pay tax on their income because they can pay less by living in America, well, frankly, let them, and we'll see how many do. Right. Um... Very briefly, the bank balance sheet tax, two and a half billion, Michael and Shirley. Um, I think the banks have a fear 
um, which is justified, is that how long is this going to go on for? How many times will the political will come back and demand another you know, slice from them? And I think this is something you see very clearly throughout history. I mean, I think the inquiries into the US banking system after the Wall Street crash of 1929 ran through into the 1950s. So I think this, what this really tells me is there needs to be a fair settlement and one that is a final settlement between the public and the banks. Um, and that needs to be done quickly because the banks do deserve certainty about the future. Quick one, Shirley. Well, I think the... Uh, uh, Microphone. I yeah, OK. I, th <laughs> I think there's a problem with what Michael said in the sense that, like it or not, we've moved from being essentially nation state banking to global banking. And what that means is that you can't move very far in one direction without, in fact, the whole of the banking world coming with you. In particular, at the moment, on the issue of, for example, tax havens and so on, the world is becoming alerted to the fact that tax havens are not only used as tax havens, they're often used as ways of laundering money from the drug trade, from the uh, arms trade, from a whole lot of highly undesirable sources. And so inevitably, I think it's going to happen that we will see tax havens slowly closing down. I think it will be impossible for them to sustain themselves for very much longer. Um, just a final thought on this, we had last week a fascinating debate in the House of Lords on the subject of corruption and money laundering. And one of the things that came out of that was the extent to which some of the most evil things in the world are essentially financed out of tax havens and tax evasion systems. And that means, for moral reasons, we have to address them. And I think that that will mean that the problem begins to shrink. Excellent. Good. I want to just put um, a couple of questions to the, um, the, the meeting. Let's get the mood of the meeting. Um, I'm going to give you a choice. It's a phony choice. You can complain about the choice afterwards if you want, but I just I want you to choose between the following two. I want you to, to assume directly contradicting Shirley here, because Shirley doesn't think there is a, it's a choice. You can have both. I want you to assume that you can either have reform of the financial system that makes it pay lower bonuses, makes it more efficient, and makes it less fat, so to speak, but won't be able to find large amounts of tax, or you can have a Robin Hood tax. Now, it's, there might be some of you who don't want either reform or a tax. You can abstain. But just assuming that it, that was the choice, how many of you would actually go for the tax rather than the reform? What? None, hardly any of you. How many of you would go for reform rather than tax? So that's that's very interesting. Okay. How many of you think, this is a follow-up question, which is in deference to Shirley, how many, of you think, how many of you think we could have both reform and a tax? Okay. So there's a sort of a mood that we should have both, can have both, but if you had to choose, you'd rather deal with the structure of the financial system. That's extremely interesting. Let me just put a question to each of you. If we tax banks more, and there are good reasons for thinking we should tax banks more. At the moment, banks actually don't pay the same taxes as everybody else for uh, reasons to do with the value-added tax system, for example. If we tax the banks more, is it sensible to hypothecate, to earmark the revenues that we get from the banks, as in the Robin Hood proposal, and say this goes to poverty, the other revenue we have goes into a big pot called taxation, which we pay for an NHS from, or would you just say, look, if we tax banks, it all goes into a big pot, and we then try and take as much out of that as we, as we can to spend on poverty? So I just want to ask you each about that earmarking that is such a key part of the Robin Hood tax proposal that is being so popularly supported. Michael. Well, generally speaking, I wouldn't support hypothecation, but I think if you put a tax raised into a general pot, it'll be spent on all and sundry. So I would actually hypothecate it, and I would also use it as part of uh, repositioning the financial system as, as seeking to be seen to be uh, a better member of society. Right. I think that if we're going to have such a tax, 
so large a part of the motivation for having it and for supporting it is that it will yield money for the poor, that if it was set up in such a way that it didn't, people would feel that to be yet another massive betrayal. So if we're to have such a tax, it must be primarily concerned to achieve those objectives, however, however put and however administered, uh, that, that, that lie behind, that are the motivation for supporting it. I feel I'm absolutely surprised. Um, I think I'm the only Democrat here. Um, I think it's the right of voters to decide how the tax pot is allocated in toto. So having a specific tax that's there for a specific purpose or hypothecation just seems peculiar to me. If we're going to increase the tax pot with a tax like this and then want to give more to developing countries because the public wills it through the political process, great. But otherwise, it sounds a bit like a scam against the voters. <laughs> Shirley, you, um, need to, yeah, you need to pick up that microphone. I'm going to tell you every time because otherwise they won't no, hear. No, I don't yeah. mind. It's okay. <laughs> I'm near uh, uh, far Michael than near Michael. That one <laughs> yeah. on this one. Um, but what I would do is quite straightforward. I would increase the Osborne tax, the present tax on banks' balance sheets, probably by about a factor of about two. I would spend that money specifically on issues which, to take this Michael's view, uh, the public saw as having the highest priority in national terms, okay. national poverty, pensioners, children, whatever. And I would hypothecate the Tobin tax, the Robin Hood tax, entirely for international purposes because it should be the beginning of a world global tax system just as two and a half centuries ago, no one and a half centuries ago Gladstone brought in a penny which began the whole system of income tax from that tiny seed so my mustard seed is the Tobin tax for global taxation but national taxation I accept this Michael's view, I think should then be paid through to what they would see as appropriate well, priorities for poverty. Probably reducing the uh, national debt at the moment, if we're being honest, wouldn't we? Um, we've got a question here which says, if other countries in Europe are introducing Robin Hood tax, should the UK join in? I think we know where you all stand, so there's no need for us to take that one. Um, I do just want to go to this uh, question, the basic question as we draw to a close here, to the floor, I'm going to put it in two parts. Who supports a Robin Hood tax and who supports it being hypothecated in the way that is proposed by the Robin Hood tax <coughs> campaign? So first, who out there is in favour of a Robin Hood tax? More or less what we have seen before. How many of you are against a Robin Hood tax? Overwhelming mood of the meeting is in favour. And those of you are who are in favour, how many of you are in favour of hypothecating it, earmarking it to the specific cause? How many of you are against earmarking? Again, a, subst a, a substantial majority in favour of the uh, proposals of the Robin Hood tax campaign. I think that may not be entirely... Uh, selected with the, 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 the nation because, of course, a lot of you have come here through groups who are part of the Robin Hood tax campaign. One question I don't think we have time to take is from James Chang from Royal Bank of Scotland who says, does the panel feel that the bankers would actually welcome an opportunity to look good by paying the tax? James, I think the answer to that, as you know, is no, they wouldn't welcome that. Uh, they'd prefer not to be taxed more. Uh, it just remains for me to uh, thank you all for coming, but above all, to thank the panel. I think we've had a really clear demarcation on the panel of different views. We've had the practical, we've had the pragmatic, we've had the principle, uh, we've had the whole gamut of arguments, and I think it's been a fascinating debate, and we know where you stand, and I think it uh, hopefully has helped a lot of you harden your views, crystallise your views, or make up your mind. But I think, above all, we should thank our panel here for such good uh, spirited debate.